Many organizations struggle when trying to implement agile medical device software development. They chicken out and let the traditional B model undermine agile methodology and thereby losing valuable benefits. I guess you found this video because you want to maximize the benefits of going agile. Hello and welcome to this short course on agile medical device software development. I'm Christian Kester, medical device software course instructor at Medical Device HQ. I have a software development background and have worked with many types of devices such as transplantation devices and wound care therapy. I've also been actively involved in the project teams authoring IEC 6234 and IEC 8234 standards. And I work as a lead auditor. This short course applies to you if you are developing medical device software and want to leverage the power of agile practices. In this short course, you will get a basic understanding of agile development. I will also help you understand how design controls can be achieved without an insane amount of administration and documentation. Then, I want to explain the difference between information and documents. Lastly, I will share some ideas on how to establish a software development procedure for Agile development. Let's get to it and starting with a quick introduction to Agile. I met people obsessed with the proper methodology of implementing Agile principles. But please avoid getting absorbed in discussions about principles. Because being rigid about what is right or wrong about Agile is not any more helpful than being strict about documentation and asking you to use a typewriter to create physical documents. Instead, let's focus on what truly adds value to your organization and workflow. The Agile Manifesto states our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Yes, I know. In the medical device industry, we also need documentation, regulatory approval, compliance, and all that. But keep in mind that no documentation can compensate for non-working software. So in terms of prioritization, valuable software is arguably more important than outstanding documentation. However, there is no conflict in aiming for both. In this short course, I will use Scrum as an example of an Agile framework to explain various concepts. The key elements of Scrum revolve around a sprint, which is a time-boxed activity. A typical sprint lasts a few weeks, but should be short enough to remain manageable and easily overseen. Despite what some believe, Scrum is a very controlled development methodology. For instance, before a new sprint is started, the development team agree on a sprint goal and plans the work that will be carried out. Once the sprint starts, the sprint goal is the focus and changes should be deferred to the next sprint. Before a sprint can begin, three key components must be in place. The product backlog, the sprint backlog and sprint planning. The product backlog is the single source of input to the development team and is typically maintained by product owner. It is prioritized, meaning that the top work items are most desired. Please know that I'm intentionally saying work items and not requirements. This is because many other tasks could be overlooked if you only use the product backlog for requirements. For instance, the regulatory department might need help preparing specific technical documentation for a new region. Or the software architecture might need to be worked on. None of these are product requirements per se, but it's still work that needs to be done. In sprint planning, the development team reviews the selected work items and determines how to proceed with them. This can, for example, result in test planning and documentation updates. When discussing both the product and sprint backlog, it is easy to get carried away by the Agile manifesto and prioritize the coolest software features because they are enjoyable to demonstrate. But remember, valuable medical device software is safe software that delivers an intended purpose. This means that many work items will not be visible when demonstrated, but will still be valuable. The sprint backlog contains the work items that will be completed in the next sprint to achieve the agreed upon sprint goal. Although the sprint backlog might be adjusted, the intent is to maintain focus on the sprint goal and avoid ad hoc coding. In summary, the three first steps of the scrum cycle offer many great references to design control. Furthermore, sprint planning offers opportunities to detail the design work before it starts. How great isn't that? 
There are two more great anchor points for design control activities that I have to mention. The definition of ready and the definition of done. The definition of ready defines attributes that work items must meet before being promoted to the sprint backlog for implementation. For example, if you choose to have software requirements in your product backlog, the definition of ready can include the activity verify requirements in IEC 6204. Simply put, the definition of ready can be used to review the input side of work to be done, while the definition of done is used to review the outputs. The definition of done acts as a checkpoint or acceptance criteria to determine whether tasks have been completed. This could, for example, include checking for updated design documentation and test coverage. There's much more to say about the Scrum framework, but for now, I hope you see it offers mechanism to control design work. Speaking of control, let me say a few words on design controllers and agile frameworks. Over the years, I've heard people say that agile practices can't be used when developing medical devices because it's uncontrolled, or even the antithesis of design controls. And to be fair, it isn't always easy to understand how agile methodologies satisfy design control requirements. Luckily, Amy's technical report TIR45 provides valuable thoughts on this topic. The report addresses the perceived conflict between agile practices and regulatory requirements. TIR45 was born in 2012 and revised in 2023. The FDA recognized the 2012 version, but the 2023 version is not yet on the recognized standard list when recording this video early 2025. I guess it's just a matter of time. Agile development methods were created due to poor match between software development and traditional project management methods. If you, for instance, develop a use interface with many use interactions, it is challenging to define all requirements before starting the work. Even if you try hard, very hard, the end result might not match the expectations because stakeholders tend to change their minds when they reach the look and feel phase. In TIR45, this is stated as except that customer needs and requirements are likely to change. Changing customer needs and requirements may seem trivial, but it's very painful in many organizations. Agile embraces changes, making change management integral to an agile development process. This can be attributed to the expectation that relevant stakeholders are part of the team, making the decision process informed and efficient. Furthermore, the desire to demonstrate functionality after increments drives the need for regular and early testing and integration. What could be better than frequent testing throughout the life cycle to demonstrate that you are in control of the design work? Agile is about valuing the customer, not only by adding cool features. You also value the customer by getting the priorities right, such as implementing a foundational risk control measure before implementing cool features. Prioritizing work is a way to control the design work. As mentioned earlier, the concept of done in Agile is fantastic. Simplified, it means continuously striving to define acceptance criteria for work activities at all levels. So far, you have learned about Agile concepts and the possibilities of integrating design controls throughout the development work. However, one thing that can kill any enthusiastic Agile advocate is documentation. To convince others that your product is safe, there is no escape from sharing information with external parties. This is typically seen as a pile of printed paper. But please try to erase this image and focus on information sharing. I want you to concentrate on information instead of traditional documents, because when developing software, you create a lot of information within your development tools. If properly managed, most information can be captured and maintained in your tools and exported to traditional paper or PDF documents only when needed. A word of advice, if you're copying and pasting information from one system to another, it is a clear sign of poor information management. I often see this happen due to fear of validating tools or because the QMS mandates that all technical documentation must be stored within it. If this sounds familiar, it is time to rethink your approach as it adds no value. And copy pasting is far from a reliable process. In summary, revisiting your information management strategy and investing in tool validation could really pay off.
TIR 45 has many interesting concepts and ideas, but I've chosen two concepts I find particularly useful to explore. The first concept can be called the layered approach, and this is a systematic approach to high-level planning. It describes what you intend to do at different points in time. The second approach is about assembling documents from pre-approved parts. Let's start with layers. The idea is to describe how functionality will evolve into a complete product and how and when various standards and regulatory requirements are met. I suggest looking at four layers, story, increment, release, and project. A story contains actionable work, also known as work items. Consequently, it is reasonable to establish evidence of detailed design, requirement traceability, and testing relating to the story. You could also consider integration and system testing, but saving this for the next layer might be more convenient. The layer above is the increment layer, and it consists of the stories worked on in an increment, which could be a sprint in Scrum. Compliance work will likely include integration testing and preferably system tests relevant to the increment. Multiple increments are then bundled into the release layer. You will likely work with regression testing and perhaps even more integration and system testing. This is also a good place to look for release management activities and formalizing documentation. Let's assume you have captured detailed design information in work items, but have not established it in a submission-ready format. Now is an excellent time to extract and convert the information into documents, such as a PDF that can be used in a submission. We will shortly return to this topic, but first, the product layer. Software products will have multiple releases because there is no bug-free software. But before ending up with numerous releases, the product layer should describe planning aspects, high-level risk management, and the relation to system-level design and requirements. The number of layers, or the, their names, is not carved in stone. If you like the idea of using layers, I suggest you describe your approach in a software development procedure and use a software development plan for project-specific adjustment, if needed. Now it's time to look at how information can be converted into documents. The idea is that we have information parts we want to convert into documentation. To honor document control principles, we should establish a mechanism to the left that results in control and pre-approved parts. These parts can later be assembled into documents. A workflow that includes creation, revision control, and approval of documentation parts will take you far. If all parts are under revision control and approved, the final document will likely be in good shape once established. Let's make it tangible by looking at some examples. The documentation parts can be stored as detailed design information in a ticket or as individual requirements in a requirement management system. The repository used to revision control the parts can be a ticket system, configuration management system, or requirement management system, for instance. The last step is approving the part. And in this flow, it does not mean carving it in stone or using Part 11 compliant digital signatures. No, this is the team approving the part. This approval can take place during, for instance, a peer review of detailed design information in response to agreed criteria in the definition done. It can also happen during sprint review or planning. Now it's time for the right-hand side to use parts to create documentation. Parts from the repository are collected and merged into documents. How easy is that? The steps required to achieve this are to assemble parts into documents and formalize them following your QMS procedure for document control, including the approval process and document storage. If you combined the idea of using layers and assembling documents, you would contribute to documentation in all layers, but the formalization of documentation can be postponed to the higher layer. If you do this right, you will get high-quality documentation with a minimum of administrative burden. Nice. Now let's discuss an agile development process. The first topic to address is the scope of your agile process. Perhaps your immediate response is, I want everything to be agile, and you want to be release ready after every sprint. But before we jump to conclusions, let's look at a few challenges with the term release. A product release can be described as a three-step approach. It starts with a software release, followed by what I call a design release, and lastly, the product release. 
The main difference between a software release and a design release is that the software release only considers software functionality. Things like instructions for use, technical description, or design validation are not part of an IEC 6234 release, yet they must be included in a complete release. The difference between a design release and a product release is that the product release often involves interactions with external parties, such as the FDA or a notable body. These external interactions often take considerable time. It is worth noting that standards and guidance documents do not mention design release, but I hope you see the point in the three-step approach just described. Now let's get back to the initial question. What is the scope of your Agile activities? I believe using one of these three release steps is wise when defining the boundaries of your Agile ambitions, because each step can be explained with precise inputs and outputs based on your organization's need. So when deciding the scope of your Agile ambitions, consider suitable constraints and the duration you might need to work with. And even though one size fits most, you might end up in mixing methods for different purposes. In this short course, you have learned about the possibilities to include design controls in Scrum, how to manage information, and lastly, possibly constraints for the scope of your Agile ambitions. With this information at hand, you should be equipped with some ideas on how to write a software development procedure. And when doing so, please don't fall for the temptation to write it as a traditional V-model procedure following IEC 6234. Such an approach would leave all projects without guidance, and that is not the purpose of a procedure. So if you want to go agile, your procedure should define the activities and processes you want development teams to follow. I suggest you set the developers as your primary audience for your procedures. The procedures should guide and help with activities such as sprint planning, execution, review, retrospective. To help people unfamiliar with the terminology, you could consider adding a process summary in the procedure to bridge your development approach and traditional medical device terminology. An obvious drawback of my suggested approach is that it becomes harder to demonstrate compliance with IEC 6234. But what is most valuable? A procedure that is helpful every day or a procedure that is helpful a few times a year when audited? I believe you can get both. Focus on those who are expected to read the procedure most, the developers, and provide a detailed cross-reference between the procedure and the clauses in IEC 6234 for auditing purposes. This approach should take you through most audits without problems. Thank you for watching this short course. If you want to learn more about using Agile methods in medical device software development, sign up for the full course Agile and Medical Device Software on medicaldevicehq.com. If you don't want to miss out on more premium content from our online courses, subscribe to the medicaldevicehq.com channel by clicking on the subscribe button. You will be kept up to date with the videos we publish and you will also help us reach out to more people that work in the medical device industry. Go on, subscribe now. Thank you.